Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of this great country called Canada. Now, over the course of this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone who lives there. Today, we are honored to be sitting down with Bridgewater, Nova Scotia Mayor David Mitchell. But as always, if you can do us a favor before the interview starts, hit that subscribe button, give us a like. Leave a comment about where you're listening to this episode right now so we can engage with you. We can keep track of where people are actually listening to our episodes of the Cross Border Interview. It does help us understand where we should be focusing on. Are there municipal leaders in your community that you think would be a great addition to our lineup? Send us through their names because we are always on the hunt for more municipal leaders like today's guest. Now, on to our interview with the mayor. David, I want to thank you so much for sitting down with me today and uh, taking time out of your busy schedule to talk about yourself and the community of the town of Bridgewater, Nova Scotia. But I want to start with sort of the generic question that I've asked every single person who's ever come on this show. So you're no exception to this question. And that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from? Oh, boy, that's a ooh, that's a big question. Um, start off with the easy one, I tell you. Yeah, that's it. So, so I have to think back about, um, so my family, we moved to Bridgewater from Toronto in, uh, in 2002, we had at the time, just two small boys, two and two months moved to this small town and, um, for no other reason than we just wanted to get out of Toronto. So uh, we loved it, but in early 2004, so that's a municipal election year, uh, at the time, even way back then, this is unique to small town councils. It was televised. Uh, it was on Eastlink TV, ironically, the number one show on Eastlink TV at the time. And and I watched, I don't know why, and I watched <laughs> and listened as a counselor said, we should be the retirement capital of Canada. And I was a stay-at-home dad at the time. My wife was the breadwinner. And I, I was, you know, every day trying to find something to do with these kids during the day in this small town. And those words just were like, you might as well have just said, David, you've made a huge mistake moving your family to Nova Scotia, because that is not what we came here for. Um, the thought of this, this community becoming the retirement capital, keep in mind, you want to have retirees and you want to have seniors. It's all you want every demographic, but we didn't move here to move to the retirement capital. So from that, I guess I felt, you know, looking at, at the average age council at the time, um, I thought, I, you know, not going to change things from the outside. So I'm going to run for council. So we'd only been here at the time for, for two years and uh, ran for council. And then from that, I just, you know, either love it or you hate it, but I loved it. And so it, it, there was no turning back. So, so it brings up a good question because I, I didn't know that you moved there in 20, 2002, but I knew that you got elected in 2004. Now, when I moved to a small town in Alberta from Ontario as well, Clarington area, I moved there and I lived there for about five years and people still thought of me as the outsider coming in and trying mm -hmm. to run for council. But yep. two years, you, you kind of don't even get your house unpacked in two years and you're already off running for a council seat in your community. Was the decision easy to say, okay, I'm still relatively new. There may be people who have been here for a long period of time who know the community better than I do. But no matter what, what I heard at that council meeting of Bridgewater being the retirement capital of Canada, I need to step in and sort of make my voice heard to say, no, I want it to be sort of a place where everyone can be. So I didn't realize until after I had submitted my papers <laughs> and there was no turning back that... I didn't know what a, a come from away was. I hadn't really heard it. I had heard lots of people say, oh, you're new, you're from Ontario, like that. Um, and it wasn't until after that I was sitting beside, it was just before we had the first candidates debate and the person sitting beside me said, you know, you can't win because you're a CFA. And I'm like, I don't know what, I don't know what that means. <laughs> and they're like, you're a come from away. You, the, people will never elect you in this community because you're not from here. And of course that, you know, at first I was like, oh my goodness, like I didn't, like, should I not have done this? But then of course, I would think most people have that a similar reaction, which is, oh, you watch, like just doubling down. Um, and people were supportive. Like there were a few people that kind of said that, but at the same time, they said it like, I will vote for you, even though you are from 
you know, from away and we need that new, new perspective. So I didn't really realize it was a thing. I didn't, I didn't think it would be a shock to people. Um, I thought and it, it was seems like little... it did matter to people because you did get elected in that election. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I thought maybe it would be a bit of an uphill climb just because I didn't have any name recognition. Um, but I did know enough to know if you go door to door, you can introduce yourself. And it's, it's one of those communities that small town Nova Scotia, you have a conversation with someone and they like you, they'll probably vote for you. So that, that worked, it all worked out. So you have been reelected, uh, in 2004, 2008, 2012, elected mayor in 2016, and then acclaimed just recently in 2020. Yeah. I didn't you... actually reoffer in 2012. I did take a take a okay. gap term <laughs> I, I apologize for that i must have misinformed mis misread the salt wire <laughs> wire interview that i read um i, I want to talk about the the change in municipal government because you've been there for some time and you've probably seen the good the bad and the ugly of municipal politics particularly mm -hmm. in the last few years compared to when you first were a councillor what's been the biggest drastic change in municipal politics and municipal governments that you have seen personally as a small town mayor in Nova Scotia? Uh, so the good has been that I have seen uh, my colleagues uh, younger and more diverse. So uh, a lot more women, a lot younger uh, people running, a lot of people from different backgrounds, a lot more CFAs, people from, <laughs> from not just other parts of Canada, but from other countries that are councillors and mayors in this province. Um, and so it, it it certainly tells me a couple of things. The first is that people are more um, apt to get involved in their community and they're more um, emboldened to run to, to shape the destiny of their community. But also it tells me that the voters uh, are certainly very open-minded uh, for change and, and recognizing that somebody new is not a bad thing. Uh, I don't just mean new on council, but someone new in their community um, is bringing fresh ideas. And so that is probably the biggest change I've seen um, from, from tip to tip of this province is just that change in who is sitting around those council tables. Gone are the days, I hope gone are the days, where it is just a bunch of uh, older white gentlemen um, who are conducting business the way we used to do it 50 years ago. I, I, I can't think of today more than maybe one or two councils that might look like that. And maybe there's none now. There certainly were a few short years ago, but not anymore. Has apathy changed? Because you talk about how you moved to the community and you watch the council meetings. And I'll be honest, I'm probably the only person who does that on a Wednesday night. I was just doing this prior to our interview of watching municipal council meetings in full just to see what issues are being raised. But and you were watching it on East Link when you first moved. Do you see an apathy compared to or a renewal of apathy in your community of people not engaged in municipal politics like they are provincially or even federally? Yeah, so it, it, that's hard for me to say because we are so connected to our community. So we live stream on Facebook. We put everything on YouTube. Um, Pre-COVID, we also had East Link still. We don't have East Link now, but also I think it's because we're just on multiple platforms. Um, our, our social media feeds are active. I am constantly engaging the community through, through social media. Um, we do a lot of, uh, we could do a series called Talk Bridgewater, where quarterly all of council is just kind of parking itself at the library or the mall or or somewhere on the sidewalk sometimes to engage people. So um, we hear from people. So we're, it may seem funny that like our council meeting, no one comes to our council meeting, but they don't need to come to our council meeting because we're so um, reachable. But I do think some communities, I still see some communities hiding behind, oh, you know, technology, we can't really live stream, you know, our internet's not great. Like there's a bunch of excuses to make it so you can't be reached. And unfortunately, I think the reaction for a lot of our communities is not, demanding that they become more open and transparent and demanding that they figure out how to live stream their meetings. It's just like, well, no news must be good news. So, um, you know, for some people, it's still at the end of the day, if I'm looking at my tax bill and nothing's changed then I don't really care, which is, which is unfortunate. I always say if your garbage isn't picked up and the water's turned, if, if the water doesn't turn on municipal councillors usually don't get called on a regular basis. You're not far off for sure. Um, but on that note, I want to talk about the jurisdictional roles for a second, because I've been hearing from municipal leaders, even in Nova Scotia, 
that there's a misunderstanding, particularly after COVID-19, of the jurisdictional roles that municipalities play. And I can imagine in your time in office, you are dealing with provincial issues, federal issues, school board issues, health issues that are provincial, and even municipal issues. And these are the issues that people are talking about. How do you wave through the issues knowing that you have a jurisdictional role for a municipality standpoint, but your residents don't care because they want you to address all the issues, whether it be federal, provincial, school board? Oh, Chris, you're 100% right. So yeah, COVID, <laughs> COVID just blurred the lines. And a lot of that was because we were the only people that were on the ground. We were the only people that were, um, like I was still coming into town hall every day. Like we were, we were the people that you could see at the store, even though everything was closed, you know, we were still in the places that weren't closed. So we were the catch-all. We were already kind of the catch-all before. Um, but now it's it's everything from I don't have a doctor, which obviously is a provincial issue, uh, to I don't have housing, which is another provincial issue. But we're the we're the people that are here, and what we're seeing more and more, especially if you use housing for example, is because it's because the need is so great, and because it takes so long to get every order of government kind of aligned. We have municipalities that are building houses, and municipalities that are are involved in housing. Um, so yeah, absolutely, we are expected to to basically answer at the very least answer or direct people because we're the we're the complaints call center for for every order of government and for me it's it's difficult because the easy answer would be call your mp or call your mla but i don't think and i don't think i'm just speaking for myself i think most members around at least my council table would say give me your number let me call the mla and see what i can find out and i'll get back to you and maybe that's the wrong way to do it maybe that does blur the lines but, um, you know, at, at the end of the day, we're all neighbors, so we got to figure out how to solve their issue. Is it easier for you to pick up the phone and talk to your MLA compared to a resident? Because I hear from counselors that sometimes they'll get the call back before the resident gets the call back on an issue that they're talking about. So when you talk about blurring those jurisdictional lines and it's easier for you just to call them, is it because you're probably more likely to get that call back? And I'm not picking on a political party or anything like that. Please don't think that I am for anyone who's listening to this or watching this. I, I truly want to sort of dive into this and ask, is it easier for you to connect with your uh sort of uh, your per, uh, mm. political counterparts compared to residential uh, people who are asking the same issues? So I would say sometimes. Okay. Um, so I'm just, and again, you're hundred percent right. This, this goes back, this is all three parties. And this, this, my, I've done this for 15 years. I've, I've been a, a either a counselor or a mayor under three different, I don't want to say under, cause we're not levels of government, we're orders of government, but uh, alongside three different provincial provincial party led governments um but the yeah again i would say sometimes so depends on the mla who the mla is because you know what lots of residents know i think of i think of mark fury for example who was our last mla he would have known tens of thousands of people through his policing role who probably had his personal number and probably would have been able to just call him up and say hey mark i have an issue here um, and probably the same with our current MLA with, with Becky. Uh, it depends on the issue. If it's, you know, I'm calling my MLA and it's, this is a real scenario where I've called my MLA and, and Minister Druin and just said, you know what, I've got 50 people that have the same issue. Well, that's that's going to get her, you know, she's pretty quick at, at turning that around and getting some answers versus one person calling over here and saying, I have this issue. And then six months later, it's another person calling the same issue. So it depends on the people and it depends on the situation. And sometimes it's harder for me to get an answer. Like if we're going to be, you know, fully open and transparent, um, sometimes it is easier for the, um, the resident to get an answer um, because, you know, I think that lots of people get sick and tired of hearing from us because, again, if we're the complaints department for the community, we're calling an awful lot. And that person, I'd probably, I'd get sick of it myself. I, they're probably getting sick of hearing, and hearing from us. So uh, your role as a municipal politician is not a full-time paid role. It is a full-time hour job, I'm assuming, uh, but you do not get paid the equivalent to the hours that you work because you are on 24 seven. You go out to the grocery store, you're the mayor. If you go out to the, your community uh, event, you're the mayor. If you go out to a restaurant with your family, you're the mayor. 
How do you balance in a small town like yours, where it seems like you're engaged, seems like people want to talk about issues, balancing the personal life and a private life of a municipal leader in a small town in uh, uh, Nova Scotia? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so my first term on council, it was very difficult. Um, and, and I probably made some mistakes in being someone who replies to every comment that in every question that people had online, it, it, I know how I feel if I send someone a message and they don't reply to me. Um, so I didn't want to be that person, but it, it then it's then set the standard where people thought I was going to reply to everything, which I which I do my best to. So so it meant working twenty four seven in recognition of that. So it, before six months before every election, we have a citizen led committee that will reevaluate the remuneration that council council members get um and so it was it changed drastically in 2020 before the last election where they realized gone are the days where you know a mayor especially can can you know yes you're on 24 7 but you're really you know you're working maybe 10 hours a week or 20 hours a week and so you know if i'm putting in 60 70 hours a week so i i will say uh for for the role that i'm in now the compensation is is reflective okay. of the hours worked um and and counselors but there's um, days that you probably just want to be david right there's probably days yeah, so that there's you none just of those wanna... there's none of those days anymore um my my family i wouldn't do this if they weren't on board um and so they're they're super supportive of that and they recognize that you know yes my wife doesn't go shopping with me very often because getting a loaf of bread takes an hour i love it um i love talking to people which is interesting because I'm I'm a I'm a social introvert, so I'm a very shy person. But um, people are generally nice, and I don't mind talking to them. So it will take me an hour just to get a few items at the grocery store. But if I solve two or three problems there, then then great. Where it gets a little um, concerning, or where um, it can be a little frustrating for the family, is I'll just give you an example. Three Christmases ago, two Christmases ago, sitting down on Christmas Day to Christmas supper, it is five o'clock in the evening, and there's someone pounding on the door, wanting the mayor <laughs> to deal with an issue. Um, and so that that was kind of a one of those moments where we just said as a family, like, yes, we get it, it's twenty four seven, but there are <laughs> there are some lines you don't cross, and that was one. Um, so it, there are days that it it's not balanced, but honestly, Chris, for the most part, um, we just we understand it, and and most people are super respectful. So it, it is what it is. The role of the municipal government is the closest to the people. The decisions you make on a day to day basis are going to impact your residents the next day after the decision is made. Bylaws, taxes, you name yeah. it, they impact the next day. Provincial could be a few months. Federal could be a year, two years, possibly even a yeah. decade. And I can imagine, and in your time in office, you have made some pretty tough choices, and particularly around budgets, because budget seems to be the most contentious issue that people have, barring none, snow removal during the winter seasons, because <laughs> no one seems to understand. <laughs> yeah. But you have to make some tough choices, and you're not going to please 100% of the people. How do you go into a council meeting, know that you're going to have to make a decision that's going to impact your residents, your friends, your neighbors, your loved ones on a sort of local level where the next day you might see them at the grocery store and you're going to have to hear from them about what issues they are having with the decisions you're making? Um, I explain things to death. <laughs> so I... Um... So I would say yeah, I have a, I have a love hate relationship with social media, but I, I will say that one of the things that I think we do well in this community is explain the reasons why we have to do something. So I'll give you an example. We raise taxes twice in three years, 10 cents each time, painful, just painful increases. And you sorry, know, sorry, 10% or 10, 10 cents. cents? Okay. 10 cents. Okay. Right? So, sorry. So we did, I thought we you said 10%. That. I was like, whoa. Yeah. No, 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 <laughs> definitely not 10%. Um, okay. so, so 10 cents in 2020, so an election year, and and 10 cents um in uh in 2023. And those are painful increases. And if you think of 2023, we were already sitting at you know nine percent inflation. Um 
So it's it's a long form explanation to the community that we have massive infrastructure upgrades. And if we don't do these, all these other things will be sacrificed. You want affordable housing, can't have it without bigger pipes. You want to stop polluting the river, can't have it if we overflow into the river. All these things, explaining it and um, and owning it, right? So, you know, especially if it's, you know, just again, infrastructures are basically our biggest challenge. Uh, explaining that for 40 years, we underfunded it. We artificially kept the tax rate low out of fear that people would be upset of raising taxes. And the irony is now, in you know, twice in three years, they've seen a, a large increase in their tax rate because we were too afraid to do the right thing over many years. And and I'll be honest, I I don't hear a lot of pushback from people. I know people are upset and I know that they're not happy, but they understand why. Um so I think we do a very good job of just getting ahead of it. And when I say long Facebook posts, I mean a really long Facebook post. I've seen saying some of this them. is why, <laughs> and this is why we need to do it. And this is the benefit that will come after. Um, you know, it's it's not unlike when we purchased our first electric police car. Yes, the car cost more, and but it will save more in its lifetime. And for the majority of people, they went, okay, I know that car costs more. I don't like that you paid more. But if you're telling me the end result is a positive for the community, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. So it's that's what it is. It's just a lot of communication and honest, honest communication, not sugarcoating it. Like when we do a budget, we will tell them we are budgeting for worst case scenarios. We we don't budget with assumptions on grants. If we get those grants, the budget will be better. But if we don't get those grants, this is what it is. And so generally we we do end up a little bit better. But but uh, it's just that open, open, con um, open conversations with the community. I'm going to kind of ask a political question here, and I apologize to throw it out here. But <laughs> in 2024, you're, you're, I'm assuming you have already started looking at next year's budget. You're starting to look at where you're going to be potentially cutting services or cutting uh, areas where you could potentially cut the trap fat so you don't have a massive increase to taxes. You talk about grants and funding. Um, is the province coming to the table? Is the federal government coming to the table when they're talking about potentially helping municipalities sort of navigate these sort of economic challenging times? Oh, that's a big question. And it, oh, it's a loaded question. <laughs> um, so yes and no. Okay. So it, it it depends if I, if I want to use, so for, for Bridgewater, our budget is lean. We, we, we can't really cut more without dramatically cutting services. And when you cut services, you know, people want, a, they want you to cut their budget until you cut their services and then they, then they're, they don't want that. So it's all wastewater. So just to put things in perspective, we have, we have a, over $50 million worth of wastewater upgrades to do in the next 10 years. Our entire capital budget most years is about $6 million for everything. And we have to put more than that just in wastewater every year. So the federal government has stepped up for that um, with some funding. Um, the province has not yet stepped up with funding. It doesn't mean that they won't. I think at the end of the day, to go back to the original question, there is there is still that disconnect when you talk about... Um, you know, each order of government is supposed to do its own thing, right? We are we are roads and we are traffic lights and water and wastewater and then the provincial government's housing and then the federal government, like military and things like that. Um, but we rely on both of them to give us money to deal with our stuff that is not in their purview. Um, but I think there has always been and there will be for some time that disconnect on, and again, I'm going to pick on housing, we get a lot of housing announcements, um, which are great. We need more housing, but you can't build housing if you don't have infrastructure. So there's a disconnect because they're like, well, we just we just gave you whatever. If I use Halifax, for example, $70 million for housing. But if the pipes in the ground aren't big enough, did you give them any money to fix the pipes in the ground? Because if you didn't, they can't build any housing. So we have to figure out how to, to break this cycle of poor communication. Where I, When I say I need infrastructure and you say we need to build more housing, you can't do your thing if I can't do mine. <laughs> so we're not, we're, we're, we've got a long way to go for that. 
Okay, so on that note, I'm going to move to the second segment, and that's the, the the community as a whole, the town of Bridgewater as a whole. And before I ask this question, I'm going to preface it by saying this is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not a policy of council. We get emails about this question. I don't know why, but here we are in 2023. Okay. In your Exciting. opinion, David, <laughs> yeah. what do you see as the biggest issue facing your community today as of recording this episode? Oh, uh, yeah, infrastructure, because that is a foundation for all our other issues. So housing, a lot of people would say housing is our issue. Well, we could do more housing if we had better infrastructure. Um, you know, the cleaning up our river, we'd be able to clean up the river if we had better infrastructure. So, so what's holding us back as a community um, for our biggest issue, which is housing, is, is our lack of, of adequate wastewater infrastructure. So that in Bridgewater, like most communities, I would say, housing is is up there. Can talk about healthcare and doctors, and and uh, we're getting better at that. We've been very fortunate, but but it does housing housing and infrastructure, which are interconnected, are the number one issue. So I'm going to talk about infrastructure here for a second, and I want I want to play in the sandbox for a little bit because that's oh, a sexy topic. Infrastructure. Oh, wastewater treatment plants. Woo! Tapes oh, <laughs> on the ground, fantastic. Um. But as my, most of my listeners are municipal leaders, they're excited as well with this they conversation. They know. They're on the edge of their seat. They're like, oh, let's go so down you, this road. So you talk about the need for infrastructure. You talk about the need for maintaining infrastructure, improving the infrastructure, adding to the infrastructure lines that you already have. How are you doing this? Because you can't do this on the back of your residents. Because if you do, they're going to see a significant tax increase. So give me some hope that Bridgewater is looking at ways that they can potentially alleviate the infrastructure issue while trying to grow their community in a sustainable way that can bring people's, uh, bring developers to their communities to build houses. Give me some yeah, hope. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we've got, we've got some hope coming from the federal government. Uh, we do believe there's a lot of programs we can access. Um so but you're you know, up I, against every other municipality. So how do you set yourself apart when you say, hey, Trudeau or hey, Houston, we need some money here and Bridgewater is where you need to invest? Well, we're just we're Bridgewater. <laughs> don't you want to don't you want to make your investment? here? No, I mean, I, I say that only half kidding because we're doing some, you know, yeah, we're 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 Bridgewater. Right. So we're not in Halifax. We're not Toronto. But my goodness, we do some really cool things and we do some really cool things that have a global impact and have been recognized around the world. And so I do think that there is a recognition um, absolutely at the federal government, because I've heard it, that they want to invest in a community that is is kind of an example they can lift up around the world when they go and have conversations, whether it's our Michelin plant that just received significant investment or it's our, our energy poverty reduction plan, um, things like that. I think they want to invest in an area that they can also see the the tangible tangible benefits of that investment, um, and I think the province sees that as well. I mean, we had a major investment in public transit um, at a time where you know it was was not really being funded to that degree, uh, and the province essentially bought us two buses, which was amazing because they they could, you know, again it goes back to that communication. We presented that case, so I I do. I mean, we've had two tax increases, as we just talked about. So our, our but citizens- But 20 cents is not a tax increase, if you ask me. Like, 20 cents does not seem like that a, of a substantial tax increase. If, if when I talk to other municipal leaders who are saying they're raising their taxes like 5 10% right now, 10, 20 cents is not that bad at the end of the day, isn't it? Uh, 10, 10 cents was 7%. And we've done that twice. But so- Okay. Yeah. It's, it still just doesn't seem like that much in, in the grand scheme of thing. Like 10 cents, like, are we talking 10 cents a month or 10 cents a year or 10 cents? Overall? No, it's 10 cents per, it's 10 cents per, uh, per hundred dollars. Uh, so our tax rate was one seventy five a dollar seventy five per hundred. And now it's, you know, it's one ninety five per hundred. Okay. That's still so, so for the, av for the average house, it's between two and $400 a year. So for some still, people it it's, it's yeah. large, right? For if you have a, you know, if your house is worth seven fifty or eight hundred thousand, it's probably a thousand dollars a year. Um, I guess when you, when you put it that way, it's a little bit more yeah. reassuring. It's just when you said ten cents, is like that doesn't seem like that much. Like if my taxes went up ten cents next year, I'd be 
freaking fantastically it's happy. 10 cents per hundred dollars <laughs> yeah there we go i should yeah. have clarified that okay i apologize continue yeah so, so yeah so at the end of the day they're 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 gonna bear a lot of it now remember what i said earlier which is for 40 years we under we underinvested in our infrastructure so you know as i explained to people um we kind of didn't pay for a long time we should have been paying incrementally that 20 cents over 40 years and we didn't so we either saddle the next generation with it or we deal with it now and i think we've saddled the next generation with enough of the climate mess um that we didn't want to burden them with this and so i think people have also went yeah okay fair enough um and then yeah we're gonna we're we, i'm confident we're gonna get funding because i i can't see the provincial or federal government just saying no um but you know time will tell weirder things have happened um Okay, you've talked about housing, you've talked about infrastructure, talked about even about the affordability issues that your community is going through right now. But if I went to talk to 100 people in Bridgewater today, and I asked them that exact same question, what do you believe is the biggest issue facing their community? Now, they're going to give me some of those macro issues that you just talked about, infrastructure, housing, yeah. affordability. But then that they're is- going to give me the micro issues. They're going to give me, there's a pothole in front of my house and I yep. need that fixed and the council's not doing anything about it. I need better service levels. How do you look at individual issues with the understanding that you are there to move the city forward? And address issues as a community and not forget about the people who have individual issues that you need to address on an individual basis as well, because you do not have an unlimited supply of money. If you did, you would have all these infrastructure issues fixed. So yeah. how, how do you run a budget that you have to balance that makes people feel like their issues are being addressed in a timely manner? So it goes back, honestly, it goes back to that communication and explaining why we can't do something if we can't do it. So if I think are of a people pothole, willing to understand that, though, like, are people willing to say if you say no to them, which is the hardest word to say as a politician, if you say, no, we can't fix this road this year because John's road down the street is a lot worse. They're going to feel upset that, that my road's not getting fixed, aren't they? Um, Disappointed, maybe. Okay. So, but, but I think if you explain the reasons why, right, if you, if you have a rationale why you can't do it, it may get to that agree to disagree stage, but at least, at least they heard, they were heard. First of all, that's the biggest issue. I don't know why politicians don't reply to people because <laughs> that person is not going to get happier as time, like that time heals all, all wounds, not when it comes to election day, right? Those people, if you, if you avoided them, you know, in year <laughs> one, in year four, they're not they're not voting for you. So if if you think that ducking your head in the sand is the best way to get through four years, you're you're sorely mistaken. So I'll, I'll you know I'll give you an example. Roads. If you talk to 100 people in Bridgewater after housing and after taxes, they are going to say roads. And we put about four to six hundred thousand dollars a year into roads. If we put anything less than a million dollars into roads, we are actually falling behind. We've never been able to put more than a million dollars in the roads. We can't. We don't have the money. So we explain the infrastructure, yada, yada, yada. They understand why that's where the money's going. But we have roads in our community that are in really bad shape. And so we have to explain to them, it's not, we can't just pave it over, right? We have to replace the sewer pipe. We have to replace the water pipe. And that road that looks like it's about $300,000 of the paving is $5 million of the work. And so we can waste our money and pave it twice in five years, or we can do it once and do it right. And most people will say, you know, that sucks because my car is doing this every time I go down the road and, uh, you know, I dented a rim, which, you know, it happens, but they understand big picture. It makes more sense to wait. Um, And then some other things we can deal with. So if someone calls, I get calls all the time for this pothole or this broke and uh, we actually just launched, a, a, we have a we have an app for the town of Bridgewater and there's a little tile called Worker B and we're telling people just go there, tell them, tell us what the issue is. And now I get emails from people saying, I, I, I filled that out yesterday and this pothole was filled today. Okay. I did this yesterday, this traffic light was out and now it's fixed. So things like that. So we can do a, we do a better job of the one-offs now than we ever used to. Um, but again, it goes back to that communication. If you can explain why you can't do it now and why it doesn't make sense to do it now, people will understand. 
does asset management come into play here a lot? Because it sounds like you're doing a lot of reacting to what the community wants instead yep. of being proactive and trying to fix things as they they are about to break or about to. Does asset yep. management come into play a lot when you're dealing with sort of the micro issues around town as well? A hundred percent. And now the province has mandated that we all have an asset management oh. plan, which I mean, a lot, I'm going to say even most municipalities did not. So we didn't budget for the lifetime of that pipe, right? I still have pipes in the ground that are 100 years old. We did not plan to replace those, right? We had no costing plan starting in year one that took us out to year 100 to say, okay, now you've you've set aside, I guess, 1% of that pipe's <laughs> value each year. Um, but now we do. So now we're legislated to do that um, going forward, and, and we are doing a much better job. Um, so yeah, it does absolutely come into play. If this has not turned off every single person who's not into municipal politics about talking about asset management, wastewater treatment, the infrastructure, I don't know what has, but I love this conversation. But I am cautious of time here and I want to turn to my last segment. It's my favorite segment because I've made a promise that if you come on my show, I come to your community. It's a promise I make and it's a promise I keep. And I'm excited to be there in spring of 2024 when I'm going to be visiting a lot of municipal uh, communities in Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and PEI. So I've got to ask, as a tourist, as a future tourist to Bridgewater, Nova Scotia, what are some of the hidden gems that I need to see while I'm in Bridgewater, Nova Scotia? Oh, it's getting better and better, Chris. Every every year, something really cool happens. So 10 years ago, I would have scratched my head and said, you could go around the duck pond around Woodland Gardens. You can go to the Des Brise Museum. If you come the last week of July, you could go to the South Shore Exhibition. Now, fast forward, and I would say, we've got music on the riverbank in our brand new, uh, I say brand new 2016, um, the Genuisca Park. So every Tuesday there's, there's live music. We've got two craft breweries, both which have live music on the weekends. We've got a brand new park that has what we call the storybook trail. So as you walk along, along the park and amongst the hidden garden gnomes that are all over the place is literally the chapters of a storybook. Um, you know, we've doubled the number of restaurants in our downtown. There's a, there's, a lot more to do than there used to be and so you could you could fill multiple days just wandering around bridgewater now for sure so where do you go after a long day of council meetings after a long day of meetings with provincial parties with uh, residents is there a place that you can go and just decompress and let it all go away because you know the next day you're going to be have to get back at it and try to do your best for your community well, to be honest, it's it's hopping on my motorcycle and going down river, just turning, going down and then coming back. That's just, that's my, that was my COVID kind of mental health break was to do that. And, um, but if I wasn't like in the winter, I'm not doing that. So yeah, it, for me, it would be either a walk through Woodland Gardens. We have a nice trail through our, our cemetery, which is, you know, it's, it's quite beautifully landscaped. Um, yeah, it's just, you know, pick a park and walk around. Thank you for being the first politician to not say their house. <laughs> yeah, no, I, uh, you know, it's it's nice and relaxing, but, uh, you know, it's if a... you really need to get out of your head, you got to, you got to get out. So for me, it, uh, like I said, during COVID, I, I've been open and honest about my struggles during COVID. It was a lot to, to try to um, support a community of, of 9,000 people or more. Some days it felt like 50,000 people during a time where I was also struggling. So, you know, my wife and I both bought motorcycles, took the motorcycle course together, and it's a 20 minute run down to Riverport, turning around down, I would say arguably the most beautiful motorcycle road in this province. Uh, I would put it up against the Cabot Trail, just a stunning run down and back, 20 minutes there and back, and it clears my head. I'm gonna ask a very poignant question with that statement that you just said there. COVID-19 did affect a lot of people, mental, mental health to be exact. Now, you were on the front lines during this pandemic. You were the mayor of a community that people were looking towards. You talked about how you were getting help. Um, do you mind me asking, and I apologize if this comes out, but looking back on those times, it was probably a challenge for you and your family and your community. Are you a stronger person now than you were going into that pandemic? Oh, I don't know if stronger is the right word. Um, Are you a better mayor now than you were in before that pandemic? Yes. Yeah. 
Um, I think what it did was it really, there's a few things that highlight it, and I hope it highlighted that for everybody. And that is that we may all go through the same situation together, but we don't all go, we don't go through it all the same way. So, um, you know, and you would have seen these comments too, like, what's the big deal about this? Or what's the big deal about that? And, and yeah, for a lot of us, we probably didn't mind going to a, a place where there were 50 people. But for some other people, we need to understand that going to a place where there was five people was stressful to them. And so I think for me, it really highlighted the fact that what might not seem like a big deal to me, now pick that issue, COVID, a pothole, my garbage was picked up late. It doesn't matter. What might not be a big deal to me might be totally ruining someone's day. They have other issues in their life. Maybe they have a family issue, a personal issue. And this was like the last straw, right? Like I put my I put my garbage out and they they didn't pick it up or they whatever it is. So I think it's it certainly made me realize, and I think I've communicated this enough to the community that that I would say Bridgewater as a community is more understanding of this of our neighbors. Um, that just because you're doing okay doesn't mean that everyone else is doing okay. And just step back and and take a moment to recognize that. So when you're in the grocery store and the, the person who is checking your items is not going fast enough or they made a mistake, instead of freaking out, just understand that you don't know what happened to them today. They could have lost a parent the day before. They could have, you know, failed an exam. It doesn't matter. And it's not your business to know. Just know that they may not be having a perfect day. So yeah, I think we're better as a community for it. As brutal as that sounds, as we had to go through hell to get here. But certainly, as I, I think I'm a better mayor for it, for sure. So I want to end on the million dollar question to wrap this interview up, because I'm cautious of time, like I said. But in your opinion, what makes the town of Bridgewater such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Oh my gosh, we are the whole package. Um, so I think we have everything from from someone who's just bringing a new life into this world until the day that they leave it. Um, you know, we have everything from our natural assets to great employment options to we have a great quality of life. Um, like I said, I I left Toronto. My wife and I left Toronto with with our two boys, and and now we have a, a daughter. So they're 23, 21, and 17, um, and no regrets, no no pull to go back to Toronto and all that it offers. I mean, you know, it's it's my original hometown. It's it's got it's got some amazing things to offer, but everything we need is in Bridgewater. Might not be everything we want. That's a short drive away to Halifax, but everything you need is in Bridgewater. And so I I think honestly. What makes Bridgewater great is is we are the complete package for for everyone. It doesn't matter where you're from, your background, uh, your your gender, your identity, whatever it is. This is I think this is the community for everyone. David, I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to sit down and do this interview. But thank you for serving your community. It comes off in the. 45 minutes that we've only been chatting that you're sincerely doing it for the right reason. And I think there's more people like you who are out there who are wanting to get involved and I think they should. So thank you so much for serving your community and making Bridgewater a better place. Oh, thanks. This is fun. Thank you for joining us for another great episode of the cross border interviews. Your continued interest in diving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential to our mission of the show. Now, as we wrap up, it is my hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics from our guest. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button today. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date with the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content like you saw today. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support as well. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page, conveniently linked in the show notes, or by visiting www.crossborderinterviews.ca. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering the kind of content that you've come to expect from us. 
Now, once again, thank you for being part of the Cross Border Interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.